Let's solve the advent of code 2021 day 18 problem using SED, the non-interactive Unix text editor. In addition to the well-known idioms like the S command, SED provides conditional branches and a single string register called the hold space, which is more than enough to make the SED command language Turing complete. Now most Turing complete languages are actually far nicer than plain Turing machines. Not so with SED. It's a little bit nicer than programming an actual Turing machine, but only a little, at least the way we're going to program it. In fact, this program could probably be ported to an actual Turing machine without too much difficulty. Anyway, this problem provides a kind of nested list of digits called a snailfish number, and there are some operations on them. The first operation, called explode, looks for the leftmost pair at bracket nesting depth 5 or greater. And that pair gets replaced with a plain 0, and the left number in the original pair is added to the number to its left, if one exists, and the right number in the pair is added to the number to its right, if one exists. So let's start with implementing that explode operation. Now, set is called Unix's non-interactive text editor, but that's kind of boring, so let's use watch to make it interactive. And what we're going to watch is timing sed minus e for extended regular expressions, reading x program in x.sed, and we'll start with sample1.txt. And it tells us there is no x.sed, which is fine. This is what sample1.txt looks like. Let's make an x.sed. All right. So let's start by just having an empty sed program. And that will actually print sample1.txt, which is great. And I put some comments in here of what the right answers are that we expect. So let's just take care of those by just printing them. So we're going to print them and then delete the lines so that the rest of the script doesn't consider those lines. So that works. You really can't tell because it's the default thing is going to be to print the line and it gets to the end. But now we need to find the first depth five pair. And obviously the way you're supposed to do this program is to read the list as a binary tree and then write various tree walking routines to implement the operations. And said does not provide binary trees or anything you could make binary trees out of. The only data structure is a single line of input as a string with regular expression based rewrites. So we need to figure out how we're going to deal with the binary tree that way. Um, luckily, you can write a regex to find the leftmost pair at nesting depth five or greater, but it's very large and complicated. So let's not do that. Instead, we can rewrite the list markers, the square brackets, to note their heights, at which point it will be easy to find the first height one list inside the first height two list, and so on inside the first height five list, which will be the one we're looking for. So let's start by changing the innermost pairs of brackets to capital and lowercase a to mark height one. So this is the exploding code, and we'll say we're looking for a square bracket with something that isn't square brackets inside it, so it's the bottommost leaf, and we'll replace it, the square brackets, in the pattern with A's. So there we go. We've actually replaced some brackets with A's, so that's good. So now, if whatever brackets are left, replace the next nested ones with B's, and then C's, and then D's, and then E's. And each time I leave out the regular expression on the left, it just reuses the previous one. And so now we have these brackets here that have E's and B's and C's and so on and we can see the actual nesting. All right, so now we want to actually find the pair that we want, and that's going to be inside the first height five bracket set, because if it has height five, it means it has to have a leaf at, at, at depth five. And then inside that, there has to be a first height four, and inside that, there has to be a first height three, and inside that, there has to be a first height two, and inside that, there has to be a first height one. Okay. And then it's going to have numbers. Um, it's going to have something that's not an A. And then it's going to have an A. So let's just mark the thing that we found. Um, we'll take the other brackets out. We'll do a slash one like that. OK, then 9 comma 8, that's the one we're supposed to explode. Same thing with the 3, 2, and so on. All right, so now we just need to explode it. And so we need to add this 3 to this 4. And, you know, we could figure out how to add them in binary, but there are better ways to do this, or at least easier ways to do this. It's hard to call any of this better. Uh, and so what we can do is we can change all the numbers to unary. And so if we change them to unary, we could say turn a 9 into an 8 and a 1, turn an turn a, um, 8 into 4 and 4, turn 7 into 4 and 3, 
turn six into four and two, turn five into four and one, turn four into two and two, turn three into two and one, turn two into one, one. Okay, now they're all in unary, except for zero. Zero still says zero. So let's put um, an N in front of any sequence of ones, and then zero can just be an N. And so that's how we'll be able to see a zero. So let's see. All right, we have our unary numbers, and we have still identified the ones that need to move. But now that everything's in unary, we can actually add it to this pretty easily. So for the number on the left, we want to find some number. It's going to have some number of ones, and then at some point after that, you're going to have the square bracket, the angle bracket, with an n and some number of ones. And we're going to want to replace that. We're going to keep the first part and then add the ones from the end here. That's three and then two. And actually, we want to keep all of this, I think. Um, yeah, let's just keep all of that. And let's get rid of the comma. All right, let's try that. All right, so we moved the stuff in the brackets over to the left, at least when we could. Here we can't, so let's take care of that. If there's any sort of angle bracket left with n, oh, we can't do that yet. Let's see. We probably shouldn't remove the comma. Let's keep the comma. So then we can say n1 star slash angle bracket. All right, so now we have the comma there still. Good. So now we can look for the one on the right. And the one on the right is going to be n1 star angle bracket. And that needs to go to the next number. So anything's not an n, and then an n. So let's keep that. And then this is going to become angle bracket, and then keep that data, put the n down. Whoops, keep that data, put the n down, and then put the ones. Repetition operator invalid. One, two. What did I do? I don't know what I did. Let's try again. So we're going to look for n1 star angle bracket and then not n star n. And let's just say, just mark where it is. OK, that looks right. So now let's actually do the move. So we're going to put parens around the 1 star and then parens around the stuff that's not the n. And then we're going to want to say angle bracket slash 2 and slash 1. Put. All right, I don't know why that's different, but fine. And then if we didn't find anything to move, we're going to want to say n1 star angle bracket becomes an angle bracket. Good. And now this angle bracket that's left, we need to make that into a 0. And so we just need to say the angle bracket with commas becomes a 0. And then we turn, put the, uh, the brackets back. A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, E, oops, not S, Y, which is T, R, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, put. All right, that looks plausible. Um, this first one is supposed to be 0, 9, 2, 3, 4, which it is. That's great, so we just need to go back to decimal. So to go back to decimal, we can group 1s into 2s, group 2s into 4s, group 4s into 8s, and then we can build up the other numbers so eight, eight and one is nine. Um, four and four, two and one is seven. Uh, four and two is six. Uh, four and one is five. Let's see, two and one is three. Did I miss any? I think that's all of them. Two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine. Yes. All right. Put. All right, so we left the ends there, and we need to turn that n into a zero. So we'll get rid of the ends that have a digit following them, and then the ends that are left are zeros. All right, that's the right answer. That's kind of cool. So that's just one explode. We're supposed to actually do more than one if we can. And so let's see, look at sample two, which has a whole bunch of stuff we're supposed to do. This is the right answer for after the first explode, but we need to do the second explode. And so to do a second explode, we're just going to loop back to do it again. Now, this wouldn't work because this is an infinite loop if we did a, a go to to the loop variable. But sed provides a conditional branch, t, that will loop back if any s commands since the previous t or since the beginning of the line actually um, succeeded. Now, these are always going to succeed. The ones that we really care about if they succeeded are these. 
So let's just put a uh, branch in here to just clear the, the did something succeed setting. And now this, uh, these are the ones that we want. If none of these work, it means there was nothing to explode and we can fall through and otherwise we'll go back. All right, so this is now right. This is what we get after two explodes, except that we have spelled 1587 because 15 is eight plus seven because our decimal converter only handles single digits. That's fine for now because split is going to get rid of all the double digit numbers. So if explode doesn't find anything, then what we're supposed to do is a split. And to do a split, we find some, the first number that's bigger than or equal to 10, and then we cut it, we make it into its own pair of the halves. And if it's an odd number, the, the left half is one less than the right half. So let's find the number that we need to find, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and just put it in brackets. Let's say, we'll do it this way, we'll just put the ones in brackets. Um, let's print this. So we can see here's the number, 87, but let's see it in unary. Oh, let's print it after we do that. There we go, we found a number to move. And now we need to make that into two different, into a pair. So let's put the pair brackets in. And then we need to split that into two numbers. And luckily in unary, it's pretty easy to split. So what we can do is we can move the brackets in one, if we have a one, sorry, if we have bracket, and then some number of ones, with ones on both sides, we can move the same number of ones out. And so that will move us one step closer to having split the number. And then we can just do that in a loop. And here we're not as worried about what the exact T does, because if it fails and we go around again, it'll definitely fail the second time uh, with the T. So let's see, so now we have split it into seven and then bracket one bracket, because it was 15. So 15 is seven plus one plus seven. So if there is a one left over, we should move it to the right side. And then those bracket, those angle brackets need to turn into the comma for the pair. And there we have, that is after the first split. Oh, except that 85 is 13. So there's still another split to do. So we're supposed to go back and loop again. And that's fine. So now we've done two splits. Um, we did something wrong. That's interesting. Where did that comma come from? Hmm. Let's put a debug print in here. Uh, well, let, let's get rid of the loop. If we get rid of the loop, then 0747780013, that's all correct. So that comma must be coming from the new, the second split. So in that second split, we're supposed to have zero comma six comma seven, and instead we have zero comma six, these funny angle brackets. Well, that was clearly supposed to be the six comma seven, except we didn't get the angle brackets either. It's kind of weird. Um, all right, well, let's see. This was the first number we split. This was the second number we split. And then why did we print it again? We went around again. Hmm, okay. Um, we put brackets around that. Let's, let's print what it looked like after that. Wow, okay, so we, we put the brackets around and then we split that. Oh, we forgot the ends. We forgot to put the ends in. So this needs to be comma n and we need to put an n at the beginning here. There we go, okay. Now we have a valid unary number which turns into a valid binary number and this is the right, well, this is the right value after both the splits and the explode. All right, so now we're good. Take the debug prints out. So that is actually doing the right thing, which is great. Unfortunately, that's not everything we have to do. What we were really supposed to do, so in sample two, what I had was a single input that was actually the combination of these two. And what we're supposed to be doing is reading the lines of the file, do our splits and explodes, although this should be in canonical form to begin with, and then when we get the next one, we keep a running total, and when we get each line, we insert a bracket here, we put a comma in, we put another bracket, and then we do more splits and explodes to reduce, and keep doing that until we get to the end of the input. So let's leave that input alone, still two lines, and we need to make sed do that combination, which we can do because sed provides a single hold area, a single string register called the hold area that persists from line to line. 
And so when we get to the end of our program, end of our single line, we can save what we have to the hold area with the H command. And then at the top here, after we've converted the next line to unary, we want to do an accumulate with the hold area. And so let's figure out how we're going to do that. Um, on the first input, the hold area will be empty, and we want to just leave the input string alone. And on all the others, we want to take the hold area, put a comma in, and then put the, um, the new line at the end of that. So x swaps the input area and the hold area. So now we're operating on the input area. And we'll say, if we find anything, that's, that's a no-op, but it's here just to see if the s command succeeds. If we find something, then we're going to have to do an append. And otherwise, we're just going to switch back and go to the start. So here's the start label, and otherwise, and so now we need to implement the append label. So if we're going to do an append, what we're going to want to do, we're sitting on the input area, or we're sitting with the previous sum in the input area, and now the new line is in the hold area. The g command appends the hold area to the input line, uh, which is what we want, and it puts a new line between them, which will turn into a comma, and then we'll put the brackets in. And then we're all set to keep going. Well, that didn't work. Um, that isn't even close. So let's see what we did. Um, let's put a debug print in. Wow, that is really, really wrong. Let's uh, see what it looks like after we do the accumulate switch. OK, so on the first input, we have an empty string. But then we still end up. Uh, doing something. Oh, right, because these s's have already run, so this t, this conditional branch, is true even though it shouldn't be. So let's clear that. There we go, that's better. All right, take those debug prints out. All right, so now we're actually summing up those two values. So let's see, this is a bigger file. Oh, no, that's the same file. Oh, we weren't even running the input. Huh. All right, now we're in sample three. The first line is left alone, and the second line is, in fact, the right answer. Great. All right. Um, before, we had just been testing a single line instead of a pair. So I don't want to see this first line anymore, so let's just say that if it's not the last line in the file, just delete it. Now we're just seeing this final line. OK, great. So now sample four is the next thing. It's a bigger list of numbers that we're supposed to sum up, and this is supposed to be the answer. And notice, you know, we sum and we do explode and split and then keep going around again. So let's see. And we did get the answer, which is kind of incredible. And then sample five. Sample five is just a list of numbers to sum up. And we don't know what the answer is, at least not in the comment. But I think it says over here. There it is. That looks the same. That's great. And then we're supposed to compute the magnitude of this sum. And the magnitude is defined as, for a single number, it's itself. And otherwise, it's three for a pair, it's three times the left plus two times the right. So we need to compute the magnitude. Um, and so let's see. So for every time we see a pair with just numbers in it, we're going to want to say there's a pair with just numbers in it. We're going to replace it with a single number that is three times the left, two times the right. And we can actually do that bottom up. That's fine. And then we're just going to keep doing that until we run out of ways to do that, and that should leave us with a single number. And that looks like that might actually be right if we added up all those digits. I think that might be 4140. Um, let's see. Let's just do it. Set us to space. That didn't work at all. Oh, let's do it better. Slash. There we go. So now we do send that through IV. 4140. All right. So that's good. That's, that's actually the number we want. It's just not printing right because we're only printing a single digit, a lot of single digits. So let's, uh, a lot of ones digits. So let's make this into a real number. So what we can do is we can say, find me groups of, one, of 10 ones, turn them into a Roman numeral x, Roman numeral 10. Let's try that. Now there's probably 414 x's here. And, but we, if we can separate them, let's, let's look at what that looks like. We've got n and then a whole bunch of x's, and then 
there's a zero there that you can't really see. But if we separate the x's with an, its own n, now we have an n before the x's and an n before the ones. So we have the top, you know, the rest of everything, and then the ones digit. And so then we can change the ones, the x's back into ones. So now we have a giant tens digit and a ones digit. And if we take that giant tens digit, let's see if that works. Um, that probably adds up to 414, but we're, we're making progress. We got the, the ones digit out. So we can just do this in a loop. Um, just go here. There we go, 4,140, that's right. So now we're supposed to do the input. Uh, input might be a little bigger, 4111. All right, let's try it. <laughs> we got a star, all right. Part two. Part two says, oh, forget the whole running sum thing. Try all pairs of lines that are not the same line and use them or add them together and see which one has the biggest magnitude. Well, that is maybe beyond me, at least the pairing. So let's do the pairing in Perl. So let's see, we're gonna to wanna to say Perl minus E. Hmm, actually no, let's, let's, read, let's go back to sample five because that's the one that we have. I'm gonna write to a file called all and we'll say time Perl minus E. We'll read the input and then we'll chomp the new lines off. Chomp. And then we'll say for each dollar i in x, for each dollar j in at x, um, print dollar i dollar j if dollar i is not dollar j. See, does that work? And then we're going to want to time said reading from all dot text from all, I guess. Okay. So that Perl command ran in 0 0.03 seconds. And the sed command then ran pretty quickly because it wasn't reading the file. Let's try that again. All right, this is a little bit slower. Sed is uh, taking a long time to do these sums, but we don't even want it to do the sums. Eight seconds isn't too bad. So let's get rid of the summing logic. Get rid of save and get rid of the accumulate. And now we should have we can get rid of dollar bang D here. That's all the sums in sample five. And I suppose we could just sort them. Let's just do that and see what we get. So Q. All right, 3993, that is what we're supposed to have. But this kind of feels like cheating. I was willing to stoop to Perl for the, the pairs, but I don't want to cheat too much. So let's actually find the maximum value in said, and let's keep that in the hold area. So, all right, at the end of each line, we already have the maximum value or the, um, the, the value for that line. And so let's figure out whether it's better than the hold area or not, and then save it. So right here, we need to do a max with hold area. And so to do that, let's see, we're going to want to load a value. Let's load a value from the hold area. Let's take the N off. Um, well, let's not take the n off yet because the d to a will get con get confused. Um, let's see. We're going to have max in the hold area. So let's append the hold area to the current uh, input. So now we have both numbers in the input. And then let's store that back in the hold area. So now they both have two copies of the numbers. So it's OK if we scribble all over the numbers ourselves. And let's say take off if there's a 1 at the beginning of the string and then there's a whole bunch of numbers, and then there's a new line, and there's also a one, then we can get rid of both of those. We can just say, replace that with slash one slash n, or we can just put slash n in here. There we go. And then as long as we can do that, that just subtracted one from each number, and as long as we can do that, we might as well just keep doing it. Let's call that sub, t sub. And then at the end, one of the numbers is zero, and the other number is big, or at least the one, hopefully. And so we can say, or I guess they could both be zero, but either way, we can say if there's a one at the beginning, then that's great. Uh, keep the first one, and otherwise we're going to keep the second one. So to keep the second one, we get the whole area back, and then we get rid of everything up to the new line, um, and then we save it back, and then otherwise, uh, and then 
we'll say t done, b done, I guess, branch to done unconditionally. And otherwise, we want to save the first one, because the first one is bigger. And in that case, we'll exchange the whole area again and get rid of everything after the new line, including the new line, and save that. And it, right now, we're still printing it. I got rid of the dollar bang D. So let's see, we should see the max increase over time. And it's not, <laughs> not at all. All right, let's look at the pairs that we're supposed to be having. Well, there are definitely some numbers there, so that's good. Oh, the N is still there. Let's get rid of the N after we put them together. So let's get rid of the N. Hmm, all right, well, probably should keep printing. We are printing. All right, set is taking a very long time and it could just be busy or it could be um, in an infinite loop. It's always hard to tell. Let's see, we took the N out. Let's print that. We can really see if it's printing. And it looks like it's kind of doing work. All right, fine. And then we can take those out. And then we'll say if there's something, if it begins with a one, it means that the first one is the one we want. So we jump to first. We just did a T before, so this is the only thing being tested. And in first, we swap the hold area back over and then get rid of the second line and then store, it, store the max back, okay? And otherwise, we swap, get rid of the first line, store it back, jump to done, now we're in done. We should be able to print here and see if we get a print. There we go, we got some prints. Oh, it's just slow. Okay, that's okay, it's just slow. Let's try this again. What's going on is it's buffering its output and when we put those debug prints in, that created a lot more output, so it took longer before it buffered. But it's actually getting it right. It's just very, very slow. So let's make it not very, very slow. The problem is we're subtracting one at a time to figure out the min. Let's figure out if, let's subtract more than one at a time. We can do the same kind of trick. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Let's make Roman numerals out of them, at least Roman numerals with X's. And then we can get rid of X's and chunks too. And then at the end, we just have to check and see if there's an X. And if there is, we go to first. And if there's a, an X here, then we go to second. We have to tag second now. So we check for tens digits in either one. And if that fails, then we check for a ones digit. Second, let's try that. Okay, that's much faster. That's great. All right, and just, just for good measure, let's insert um, hundreds digits too. Check the hundreds digit, checks the tens digit, check the ones digit. All right, that looks good. And we can see the max growing, which is nice, but we don't really need to see the max. So let's get rid of that. All right, perfect. That's sample five. And that is actually the answer, 3993. So now let's try the input. That could take a little while longer. The input is bigger than the sample. Um, notice Perl generated the input in 0.01 seconds and said it's going to take a little while longer. Um, you know, I will say that one thing I've learned from all this is that if people really did write significant text editing programs and said, Perl must have really seemed like a breath of fresh air to have actual data structures and functions and binary arithmetic and all of that. And, you know, Perl gets a bad rap today, but wow, is it better to program than said is, which is still running here. Um, there we go. 4917, let's try it. And we got our stars. All right, have a good day.